Hello, everyone. Everyone, Welcome to opening day of two great exhibitions, um, Abstract Expressionism, A Social Revolution, Selections from the Haskell Collection, and Friedel Zubas um, from the Ira A. Lippmann Family Collection. These are two really outstanding shows. Um, I, I've told a lot of people this story. If you are here last night, you, you heard it again. But this is the work that really made me connect to art in a big way. The, when I learned that there was such a thing as the abstract expressionist, it was it literally just kind of blew the top of my head off. It was so incredibly exciting to me. And we're very fortunate to have these works of art in the, in the Dixon. I think we're going to have a really great 12 weeks that this show is that these shows are on view. So as always, do please be ambassadors for the Dixon. Tell your friends about these incredible shows and bring someone to the Dixon to see these to see these exhibitions. It really is, they really are. Uh, a, a, a rare opportunity here in Memphis. We are, we are lucky in many ways. The works in both of these shows come from single collections. And, um, and private collecting really is the very hallmark and the, and the, the origins of, of public collections, of museum collections. Private collectors make so many things happen, and they're making it happen right now in a very, in a very meaningful way. And, I'm, and before I introduce our speaker, I'd just like to start by introducing Preston Haskell. Preston, will you please stand up? Preston, Preston has loaned all the works in the show, in the Abstract Expressionism show. And so we're very grateful to you, Preston. Thank you for that generous act and for being here today. I'd also, is Josh Lippman in here? Josh, Joanna, you're going to have to stand up and represent the, the, the Lippman family. Josh will be in in just, in just a moment. But all of the works by Friedel Zubas come from the Ira A. Lippman family collection. Many of you know Ira passed away just a, just a little over a month ago. He was very excited about this show. I was, th I was just thrilled that I got to meet him and got to work with him a little bit. And um, so we're thinking of this show very much as a, as a tribute to Ira. So keep, keep the family in your, in your thoughts and prayers. Um, at this point, I'd like to introduce Michael Tamor, who is um, the director of the, the Tampa Museum of Art. And he'll be presenting the, the lecture that you see on the screen. Uh, I like the part that says, a director's perspective. Is there any other? <laughs> Michael's a great, great colleague. I hear Julie laughing back there. Um, wasn't that funny? Anyway, Michael is a Michael Tamora is a wonderful colleague. When we when we met, it was probably just over ten years ago. Um, we Michael was then the director of the El Paso Museum of Art, and we sent our Monet to Matisse exhibition to El Paso, where he was a tremendous steward of that show, and he was one of the one of the early adopters of the exhibition. John Josh, will you just please wave your, wave your hand? That's Josh Lippman right there. Thank you for your light, young man. <laughs> and um, he's a tremendous, he was a tremendous steward of our collection. And he's just been a great colleague all along. And um, he was, when he offered us the Abstract Expressionism exhibition, I took it instantly, because partly because I knew if Michael was doing it, it would be a wonderful project. I do have to shill for the shop. We've got two great catalogs right now, the um, Tampa's Abstract Expressionism book and Patricia Louie's wonderful catalog on the Lippmann Collection of works by Friedel Zubas. And Patricia Louie is in the audience as well. Patricia, will you please stand for a moment? And I promise, besides Michael, that those are all the introductions I'm going to make. Um, and with that, maybe I will just turn it over to my good friend, Michael Tamor. Hello. Can you all hear me all right? Yes. Good. There's nothing worse than technical difficulties. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, I can't tell you what it means for us to continue our strong partnership between the Dixon and now the Tampa Museum of Art. And um, geez, thank you all for coming out on this beautiful Sunday. Um, it's more beautiful than it was yesterday, um, and I'm glad it's not raining horizontally. And, um, but it was my first trip out here, believe it or not, and the gardens are beautiful, and you have a, quite a gem here. 
um, and a great steward and leader in, in Kevin Sharp, and what a great team um, everyone's been. So um, without further ado, I'll get started. <clears throat> a little bit of a story here. Um, in 2016, a member of the Tampa Museum of Art Board, Bob Isbell, um, talked to me about a former Princeton classmate, Preston Haskell, um, living in Jacksonville, Florida, and he shared with me the releases on an extraordinary exhibition called Rothko to Richter, Mark Making and Abstract Painting from the Preston Haskell Collection, um, which had closed in Princeton and at the Kummer Museum of Art in Jacksonville. The following year, Bob, by way of email, introduced me to Preston and we quickly made arrangements to visit with one another. And I was thrilled to learn um, of this focused and well-developed collection sitting in my neighborhood. Um, well, all right, it wasn't exactly my neighborhood. It was about four hours north of me. <laughs> but what was even more thrilling was learning that no museum in the Tampa Bay region, including the Ringling Museum or the MFA St. Petersburg or the Tampa Museum of Art, had ever focused their collecting habits or exhibition programming on abstract expressionism. And in front of us was the potential opportunity to share this art collection with the community, should our meeting with Preston go well. The prospect of bringing such an incredible collection to the community was exhilarating, and I was hopeful. In the car, me and my curators went to Jacksonville to learn more. And art was everywhere when we arrived, in every office, hallway, break room, and lobby of Preston Haskell's headquarters. At his home, they hung in every room of the house, from the bathrooms to the bedrooms and living quarters, the works were impacting us at every corner of Preston's world. And for that, I thank Preston again. He, his generosity in sharing his collection has and will continue to inspire all of those who are fortunate enough to be involved with the art now here in Memphis or at his business or home. After agreeing that an exhibition at the Tampa Museum of Art would be ideal at a later date, we returned to Tampa energized and excited about the possibilities for our community. Oh. There we go. So it's not always the case, and in my four years at Tampa, it's the only case that a director would determine the focus of an exhibition that would then be turned over to my team or their team but I wasn't alone in the final iteration of this particular topic underway today. I talked a lot with my curators and educators in teasing out the topic. We knew we didn't want to continue with the standard topic associated with abstract expressionist scholarship. We talked about the name abstract expressionism, how it finds its origins in the late 20s and early 30s, perhaps uniquely associated first with the work of Vasily Kandinsky. Did we really want to have a conversation about the origins of the style, the new use of color and line in the 1940s, from arguably Hans Hoffman to de Kooning and Motherwell, and then to Joan Mitchell and Helen Frankenthaler, or again from Hoffman to Rothko and Richter, and then on to Francis and Jenkins? We asked ourselves if this was really of great interest, a type of canonical, chronological timeline of transforming styles. Or another possibility was to discuss the genera generational differences of the painters, who interested whom and at what time. We talked about something more introductory for our audiences, a general overview of sorts as designed by art historians, who later lent nomenclature to the movement as the New York School, and then talked about its categorical grouping, style, shifts in styles, new artistic directions, and then the declaration of a new art movement. But we knew many had written lengthy papers on these three topics of the distinctions between abstract expressionism and the New York School, which was coined as a matter of geographic location of the artists working in this new direction, and their two fundamental stylistic directions, action painting and color field. But we wanted to add to the scholarship, so we started with the jumping off point. Abstract expressionism has most often been discussed as gestural abstraction because its brushstrokes, process of applying materials, and the individualized way in which artists created their own signatures revealed the artist's process. Signature approaches to painting and sculpture began to define individual artists rather than composition, perspective, and choice of narrative. This process is the subject of the art itself. As the art critic Harold Rosenberg explained, 
the work of art becomes an event. For this reason, he referred to the movement as action painting. Action painting often references the works of Jackson Pollock, and in this exhibition, Michael Goldberg, Joan Mitchell, Wilhelm de Kooning, among others. And they illustrate this branch of Abex. The other direction that appeared simultaneously was color field painting, reflecting on the work of such artists as Mark Rothko, Helen Frankenthaler, among others. In the case of color field artists, the picture plane is carefully filled with zones of color that create tension between shades and hues. When I talked with my team, we decided the discussions of action painting and color field, as valid as it is, and true to the art historical categories of abstract expressionism and the New York School, but missed the driving factor of the new direction. We were moving toward abstract expressionism as a direction in art that would become solidly identified with an emerging group of artists in the 1940s. And I didn't want to yet again focus on this phenomenon of the many new artistic directions of mark making or process of applying materials. Rather, I wanted to talk about how the movement itself organically grew out of social changes. All signs kept pointing to the artists who were influenced by this newfound spirit of life in post-war America. They were the driving force of change, directly challenging and forever altering the direction of art and the role of artists in the, US, in the United States society. So my team suggested I run with it and I should curate the show. Now, I don't know if that was abandoning me or supporting me, <laughs> but believe me, that was not my intention, um, but it did become my project. And what I found to be the most compelling part of the abstract expressionism um, program was its growth out of societal change. The changes grew from the individual and not the institutions, from the teachers and not the curriculum of the academies. It grew from the artists and not from the museums. Considered one of the most profound modern art movements of the 20th century, abstract expressionism was a reaction to the continued recycling of early directions in art. From the abstraction of European cubism and expressionism of the 1910s and 20s to the American regionalism and social realism of the 1930s and 40s. I mean, I couldn't choose two more different works of art that were simultaneously and generationally of the same time period. So I give you some details of how dramatic this was. Some of these artists abandoned the traditional underpinnings of earlier movements in modern art, in particular its emphasis on narrative, whether representational or abstracted. In addition to abandoning a literal narrative, they also sought out unique visions, expanding abstract vocabularies, and experimenting with new materials and applications. The desire to create something entirely new and void of traditional thought drove these vanguard artists in their search for an original art to represent America's reinvention of itself after the post-war period. New immigrant voices continued to arrive in the United States from Europe after the fall of Paris to the Nazis in 1940, coaxing New York to emerge as the center of the art world in the decade that followed. And with only regionalism and social realist painting to call their own, many unsatisfied American and recently immigrated painters worked tirelessly toward an original American voice. And indeed, one developed. To borrow from art historian Dora Ashton, a quote unquote view of existence and an expression of the human condition as content would be regarded as the new direction in art in the United States. And although they didn't share a similar style and set of artistic values, these emerging artists learned from one another and encouraged one another to seek out their own personal truth and visual vocabulary and join in a revolution of personal expression in art. They challenged each other, as well as the museums, academies, universities, and private collectors to reach beyond perspectives of the first half of the 20th century. And ultimately, I would choose work by a group of artists who together and independently of one another influence this new freedom of personal expression in art that continues to this day, something brand new. These artists influenced by the newfound spirit of life in post-war America were the driving force of change. They directly challenged and forever altered the direction of art and the role of artists in the United States. The social revolution started with talking 
not painting, and the famous Cedar Tavern was the number one hangout in the, in, for New York school artists like Pollock, de Kooning, Robert Motherwell, Mark Rothko, and Franz Klein, just to name a few. They gathered here at least every other night to drink, socialize, and discuss art. In fact, it is often said that it was here that abstract expressionism was born and bred. The tavern changed location several times, but in 1945 it moved to University Place, where it experienced its heyday. Pollock and the like were, found, um, <clears throat> were fond of the cedar for its cheap drinks. They were about 15 cents a beer, to be exact, and unpretentious location on the off-the-beaten-track University Place. The cedar was a dive. Its bare walls and smoke-tinged air spoke little to its artistic clientele, but on the corner of University Place and 39 8th Street, where they chose to congregate and, and drink, and drink. And in the tavern, Pollock called other artists worms, and the lot decreed Matisse's work as decorative. To the action painters of New York, producing decorative art was tantamount to selling one's creatively inept soul to the devil. At the bar, philosophizing and commiserating about American avant-garde art, meetings were marked by heady discussions, drunkenness, and, and friendly derision. De Kooning and Pollock's relationship was probably the most contentious and became the best known of the group early on. Armed with their own critical champions, Harold Rosenberg and the art critic Clement Greenberg, respectively, the two were stylistically pitted against one another and their reputation surfaced in the art world simultaneously. Art critics would soon become a major driving force and their opinions mattered to those collecting and exhibiting this new artistic world order, or rather what I would call disorder. Much like his friend and contemporary Harold Rosenberg, the other prominent art critic Thomas Hess generally disliked a very formalistic approach to art criticism which was championed by Clement Greenberg, although both men admired Greenberg's writings. Hess believed that the approach performed a disservice by ignoring the individual actions and, in some cases, struggles of the artist. In any work of art, the thing that mattered most to Hess was the individual artist, his motivations, emotions, religious beliefs, personal behaviors, and for a critic to ignore the individual was to ignore an artwork's uniqueness. Hess had his doubts of the existence of an avant-garde movement in the arts. If one did exist, it was embodied in the achievements of the individual artist and not representative of some larger movement of artists who continually stretched the boundaries of modern art. When Thomas Hess came to the club to talk about his book, Abstract Painting, Background, and American Phase, Pollock couldn't contain his jealousy. Loosened by much too many drinks, he launched the book at de Kooning, screaming, it's a rotten book. He treats you better than me. Yet on the curb outside Cedar Tavern, the two passed a bottle back and forth, sharing liquor and slaps on the back. They flattered each other and said, Jackson, you're the greatest painter in America. No, Bill, you're the greatest painter in America. All right, so funny as that might be, um, it might have been in retrospect. What I found most interesting about this little, little interlude is that it demonstrated that Hess, like Rosenberg, as well as Pollock and de Kooning, found value in addressing this new direction in terms of the individual rather than the movement. The point being, although Pollock and de Kooning may have been the best known of the ringleaders, these artists, and there were many, many unknown to the public, loosely gathered at the cafes and also in group showings. In hindsight, they made up what was later called the New York School, showing individually and in group exhibitions regularly at Leo Castelli Gallery, Betty Parsons, Sidney Janis, and Studio 35, among many other locations. Thank you. <laughs> to the rescue, Lily. <laughs> By the way, all weekend, she's been terrific. <laughs> Some emerged and surfaced quickly in the eyes of the critics, and as a result, we reflect on these artists more often in the modern art history books, art history general overview texts focusing on the usual suspects at that time. And among them, notables featured in this exhibition are Motherwell, de Kooning, Klein, Rothko, Hoffman, Stamos, Torkoff, and Michael Goldberg. 
The trouble was, no one in the 1940s in America quite knew who the abstract expressionists were, nor did they understand their artistic mission, if one was to be found at all. And to many, their art was a confused collection of drips, dribbles, zips, and stains. To the director of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Francis Henry Taylor, they were nothing more than a quote, flat chested, they were nothing more than quote, flat chested pelicans strutting on the intellectual wastelands. <laughs> and the public certainly weren't talking about them, and there were many to be talked about. The women in particular were at first overlooked. Elaine de Kooning, Joan Mitchell, Helen Frankenthaler, and Grace Hartigan. Of those, Joan Mitchell and Hel Helen Frankenthaler feature prominently in Preston Haskell's collection. There were sculptors. David Smith and David Hare, among others, were given great playtime in the critics' eyes. Both were extremely influential among the abstract expressionists, and Hare stands second to no other sculptor in his generation, unless it be David Smith, in potential talent, wrote Clement Greenberg in 1946, and Leo Castelli was a great champion of both of these artists. Members of the early New York School abstract expressionists, they would help establish the quote, subjects for art school in 1948, alongside Mark Rothko and Robert Motherwell. And there were the photographers, among others, Harry Callahan and Aaron Siskin. Siskin began his photography career as a documentarian in New York in the New York Photo League in 1932. He oversaw the League's feature group as they created documentary photo essays of political import. And in the early 1940s, his work shifted to the abstract and metaphoric as he cultivated friendships with painters such as Franz Klein, Barnett Newman, Adolf Gottlieb, and Mark Rothko. And on the invitation of Harry Callahan, Siskin joined the faculty of the Institute of Design in Chicago in 1951, um, where he remained until his retirement in 1976. And many other painters, including Alma Thomas and Norman Lewis, two African-American masters of abstraction who were courageous in their, in their pursuit and commitment to a non-representational language despite intense pressures from the African-American community to depict social realist images. For each artist, abstraction was the ideal, universal language to express the beauty of the natural world, light, and emotion. Each artist worked independently in their New York, Paris, and Washington, D.C. studios while developing their own personal language of abstraction. Alma Thomas, best known for her colorful dots and dashes in rhythmic patterns, Norman Lewis for his calligraphic little figures in mysterical atmospheres. Although missing from this exhibition are some luminaries, I must admit, culling down 25 works from the over 200 works in the Preston Haskell collection and focusing only on paintings was not an easy task. However, I believed and still do the best of the Haskell collection shown here on exhibit in the Dixon reflects this movement of individuality demonstrating the lack of a cohesive set of ideas, a single interpretation of philosophies or current events. Now, who puts a show together like that? Let's tell a story where nothing connects up, <laughs> although it really does. Hammering home the topic, because it felt so much the way I still feel today about contemporary art, each painting belie belongs to a movement of social change, driven by artists of a new generation who rejected the historical traditions of their nationalities and their formal training. They challenged the institutions that celebrated the conventions of earlier movements in modern art. As the abstract expressionists became increasingly independent from European traditions and abandoned the classical trajectory of American art, a new distinctly American voice developed. It was, and continues to be today, the voice of independence, personal expression, and social revolution. The topic of so social revolution that continues to resonate in the US today locates its origins in the decades following post-World War II, when there was a new permissiveness towards challenging social norms and institutional guidelines of communicating information. And to get that point across, a revolution was necessary. And there's nothing more, um, nothing like a barrage of hostility to bring people together in revolt. Mm -hmm. And that in many respects explains the community that was the New York School. They came together, as one critic had put it, as a battering ram. Mm -hmm. And together, as individuals, they changed the face of the art world. 
The revolution began when the Metropolitan Museum of Art announced that it, they would hold a national juried exhibition. The title, American Painting Today, 1950. It should have been a gift to struggling young painters, um, but some modern and struggling artists in New York had little faith in the jurist's traditional tastes. So Barnett Newman gathered the troops and got organized. A fire with artistic indignation, they rallied at Adolf Gottlieb's Brooklyn apartment to draft an open letter of protest. On May 22, 1950, the letter was printed on the front page of the New York Times, its incendiary headline reading, 18 painters boycott Metropolitan, charge hostility to advanced art. The letter attracted notice. The Herald Tribune wrote an editorial calling them the irascible 18, and the name stuck and was immortalized in that quintessential publicity stunt, the photo shoot. Subsequently, Life magazine printed the photograph. They were no longer anonymous or unknown, and it all started with a letter of protest. Just something to keep in mind, Kevin. <laughs> the letter was composed to the Metropolitan Museum of Arts president, Roland Redwood, regarding their boycott of the upcoming juried exhibition and judging its director, Francis Henry Taylor, you might remember, who called them a bunch of stuffed pelicans, <laughs> and associate curator of American art, Robert Hale, for publicly ignoring the art of their time. The letter, written by the 18 contemporary artists, um, are represented in this show by five. Robert Motherwell, Hans Hoffman, Theodora Stamos, Mark Rothko, and Villain de Kooning. That was published on the front page of the New York Times. American Painting Today, 1950, the exhibition, was the Met's first attempt to compete with the Whitney Museum of Art as a venue for cutting edge and avant-garde visual expression. <coughs> The museum was interested in shifting its classical focus on American art to a more contemporary lens. Contemporary as the artists may have been in American painting today, of the 761 paintings selected from the close to 6,250 entries many of the New York schools submitted, the top three prizes of the show went to artists more steeped in earlier movements in modern art. The European Cubism of Karl Nath got first prize, Rico Lebrun and Yasio Kuniyoshi's figurative German expressionist works, second and third prize, respectfully. Perhaps the irascibles foresaw the outcome in their letter of protest. Regardless, abstract expressionism was now front and center and garnering attention, which caused a counter-reaction. The Ninth Street Art Exhibition was held on May 21st through June 10th in 1951. This was a historical groundbreaking exhibition gathering of a number of notable artists, and it was the stepping out of the post-war New York avant-garde, collectively known as the New York School. The show was hung by Leo Castelli, as he was liked by most of the artists, and thought of 